Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to The Better Satellite World, the podcast of Space and Satellite Professionals International. I'm Lou Zaccarella. Today, we continue with our new series, Space for All, a deep dive into how diversity and the expansion of human possibility are shaping the commercial space industry. This series is sponsored by Hughes Network Systems, powering the networks on which people everywhere depend. Hughes celebrates 50 years of innovation in 2021. Congratulations, Hughes. The Better Satellite World podcast is also supported by the corporate partners of SSPI, EchoStar Hughes, Access Intelligence, publishers of Via Satellite Magazine, and the law firm of KNL Gates. Additional support comes from the 3,000 members of SSPI and its chapters around the world. Thank you, SSPI. So, what are you going to do if someone calls you a bitch? Well, that was one of the first questions one of today's guests had upon her arrival at her mentor's office at the NASA Ames Research Center. She would later go on to write, race and gender should not matter in the workplace, but they do. They affect how conflict is internalized. Well, our goal for the next 25 minutes or so is to take a look at how allies are made and what allyship means within this context. And we've brought together three people who we really wanted on this podcast to help us sort it through. Aisha Bo was a mission and aerospace engineer at the NASA Ames Research Center for six years. Among her many honors, in 2012, she received the National Society of Black Engineers Award for outstanding technical contribution for her paper, Evaluation of a Fuel Efficient Aircraft Maneuver for Conflict Resolution. In 2013, she founded STEM Board, an Arlington, Virginia-based engineering consultancy that provides analytics, digital solutions, and engineering expertise to the United States Defense Department. STEM Board was ranked on Inc. Magazine's list of fastest growing companies last year. Ms. Bo is the only member of today's group that climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, I'm betting, and she's the author of that article I referred to, which appears in the January 6th issue of Aviation Week. In his three decades in the industry, Lon C. Levin has also climbed mountains of sorts. Mr. Levin is the vice president for new ventures at Lockheed Martin Space and was president and CEO of GeoShare, a Lockheed subsidiary. He is probably best known as the co-founder of XM Radio, a skilled executive who began his career as an attorney with the Federal Communications Commission Mr. Levin is an entrepreneur who holds five satellite-related patents. Perhaps the most significant achievement he may claim is his role as a well-known and consummate industry mentor. Among his many board and academic positions, Lon serves on the board of directors of the Planetary Society and as a governor of the National Space Society. Rena Buenconsuelo is a PhD student working in the chemistry department at the California Institute of Technology. Her undergraduate thesis explored the formation of organic matter and its implications for atmospheric chemistries on Titan. She currently studies the role of volatile chemical products in air quality. Rena served as a science policy fellow at the Institute for Defense Analysis, Science and Technology Policy Institute where during her fellowship, the USA established practices for federal government launches of space nuclear systems. She was named to the industry's list of 20 under 35 rising stars with promise. Raina has contributed to a number of other significant research projects, including space traffic management. So Raina, Lon, and Aisha, welcome to the Better Satellite World. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. Great to be here. Well, we're going to get right into it because really this is a topic that we've been wanting to to get to for some time so what we're going to just going to discuss is how to create alliances in a diverse workforce which has among its unique mandates and business interests the formation of a culture for humans beyond life on this planet Uh, so you know not necessarily with that top of mind but somewhere in the middle maybe Uh, let me start by asking Aisha first you and then I'm going to go down the line. How do you define allyship when I say that word? To me, allyship is the process of building relationships that are based on trust, consistency, 
and accountability with underrepresented communities and individuals. Very good. Lon, same question. Well, how I look at uh, allyship um, is uh, you yourself are responsible. Each person is responsible to assure that we have um, inclusion and diversity in our workforce, in our society, um, as we all go forward. It's just an important part. And I regard the leaders, whoever they may be, and we are all leaders at different times. It's essentially a situational leadership at different times. It's our responsibility to make sure that all people feel comfortable in the environment, that they are treasured in the environment, and that it is important that they can contribute as much as they want to contribute. Um, and when, well, that's enough for now, we'll talk some more. Okay, uh, so we've got two definitions. Raina, over to you for, the, for your definition of allyship. Yeah, to me, uh, being an ally is uh, sort of showing up for your colleagues and as Aisha said, particularly those who identify with historically underrepresented identities. Um, and it's, it's an active role, it's by no means passive um, and something that you have to kind of take on every day and I think is in some ways an act of resistance because being an ally, it often sort of requires challenging assumptions and norms. Um, and so sometimes I kind of, in that sense, like to think about being an ally as sort of being a good backup singer, right? As an ally, you sort of want to amplify the voices of others, but you never really want to steal away the spotlight. Yeah, that's interesting. And that's, that's, that's really the balancing act of, you know, being very, very present for somebody else. Uh, and yet, of course, having a having a mandate. Um, Aisha, I'm going to go back up to you because, uh, you know, again, the, the definitions are, are really rich here. Um, a lot of this, um, as Raina said, is, is, is active. It's, it's continuous. Um, it's also a psychological state of mind and a psychological both adjustment and wish to, you know, enable somebody else to see something a way that uh, he, in, in many cases, most cases, may not have seen before. How, how do you actually begin going down that path? I think it's um, important to highlight the benefits of allyship, sponsorship, and mentorship in professional settings, because we all want to work and live in a world where we are valued for who we are as individuals and the contributions that we can make to our workplace. And what I've found in my professional journey is that this, this process of building understanding, of investing in relationships and exploring how to better communication often yields to a diversity of thought and exchange that produce tangible outcomes in the work environment. So for me, when I, when I think about this process, I think it really begins with organizations, even one person saying, hey, I know that I have a level of power to influence the world around me. And that power is something that I personally can choose to wield to have a positive outcome on my environment and another person's experience at the workplace. Because data shows that women and underrepresented minorities are leaving the workplace for a number of reasons, but one of the key ones is the environment and a feeling of being unwelcome. And so if we can communicate to the individuals who are in the workplace and are having these exchanges that they each individually are empowered to change this environment, I think that that's a great first step to making our workplaces more inclusive. You know, I wanted to pick up on uh, where Aisha was going, you know, with regard to power, because Lon, you and I have, have had conversations about that. And I know that you talk about situational power and an awareness of your own power and how that is sort of radiating out and, and uh, impacting others. But I heard you jump in. So I, I, I know that you want to uh, respond to that. So go ahead, please. <laughs> right. Well, no, uh, this, this is great. Uh, and uh, Aisha, you, you, um, 
presented it uh, exactly as, as I try to think of it as well. And that is that um, you, the, the ally, um, as we're calling it, but I'll tell you my word soon, um, but the ally uh, has to be aware of his or her own power and the fact that they, can, that they make such a fundamental difference that when you tell me that there are women, and I'm aware of this too, maybe leaving the workforce, well, that's really the responsibility of the leaders to make sure that every woman who is part of their team knows that, um, that, that any, any attitude other than you're fully welcome is unacceptable. And it has to be, people have to be reminded of that as well as you have to speak with each individual. And that's what I try to do with, with, with every person. But what I tell people, uh, in my group, um, and each person, and I'm not talking about just a general speech, you have to do this with each individual. It takes time and effort, but you have to do it. As I tell people, I'm not just an ally, I'm an accomplice. I want mm. what you want. And I wanna make sure that whatever you want in your career, you can get, and that there are, there are no um, artificial boundaries or boundaries that have some historical, um, for, for, for history reasons are one thing, but they no longer should be there. And we're gonna keep on moving on because we need as diverse a workforce as we can. I am your accomplice and I will work with you and you must communicate with me what the challenges are. And I assure you, I will always try to fix them. But, they, but people have to know that and it has to be done. Uh, it's, it's okay to do it in a group, in a group setting as well. But I think people really appreciate it when it's on an individualized basis. As Aisha, in your great story that I read, um, uh, that great article, um, you had that with a mentor, and I think that meant a lot to you. Rena, how do you how do you hear that? Uh, what Lon was saying, uh, creating that that kind of environment where um, you've got accomplices uh, working for you. Does that does that get at this this notion of amplifying the culture? I completely agree that um, it's really important to make sure that you make yourself known as an ally and that, you know, a part of allyship is kind of um, connecting people with other people, connecting people with opportunities um, and kind of looping back to sort of what Aisha said right there is this power dynamic, but kind of within that power dynamic, it means that potentially the ally might, um, you know, be privy to more resources or just kind of be able to sort of um, navigate the field, you know, more comprehensively or, you know, carry sort of certain privileges that, you know, might make navigating that field easier. And so, yeah, I completely agree that you kind of um, both have to be cognizant of that power, but kind of um, be able to, to tell your mentees or tell the people with whom you're aligning yourself with, right? Um, that that you're there for them and that you have right those resources um, to amplify their voices. Yeah, um, you had mentioned socialization, um, Aisha. In your in your article, I, I we both referred to it the January sixth article um, in Aviation Week. Um, you you said that your mentor had you know, directed you to the importance of socializing um, as one of the concrete approaches, uh, you know, to continue to empower yourself in the workplace. Um, that seems to be a, a significant point of navigation for this, you know, and, and obviously for the people who are listening out there, they're, they're looking for best practices and tips from, from you guys. Um, is that, can you, can you go into a little bit more detail uh, on the importance of socializing and what you have done uh, to move yourself forward? You, you mentioned later on, you have a discriminating taste in single malt scotch and an occasional cigar. Well, I'm, guess, I'm guessing you don't do that every day. That's not top of mind when you talk about socialization necessarily. No, but for retirement, I'm, I'm hoping, you know, maybe. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what, I, what I loved about my time with my mentor at NASA Ames was that he understood the culture that I was about to experience was different than the one that I came from and that I would need to engage in activities that were social in this new environment. And so as a early 20s female coming out of college, I was not concerned 
with the idea of drinking single malt scotch. Absolutely not. It wasn't something that I was thinking of. I wasn't really thinking about joining the softball team or any of the other activities that were part of the lifeblood of the center. But because he suggested it and underlined the importance of it, I thought, hey, you know, I really need to better understand how I can build a common bridge between myself and individuals who are going to be one, two, maybe three decades older than I. Mm. And that was the part that was the subtle genius to me about everything that he did. It was, yes, you should socialize, but you're going to want to have these common points so you can have discussion and some level of familiarity with people who are older than you. And you can shorten that gap by doing the things that they themselves are fond of. And he also pointed out that, you know, it wasn't going to be all that likely that I could become a sports prof in like a, a year or so to give that up. Don't try to, he was like, don't try to pick up baseball or football. Let's just yeah, go right. ahead and toss that, toss that away right now. You're, you're just not going to have enough time to be good enough at the study of that if you hadn't already. But really look at the things that the community is doing and spend some time engaging in those in the hope that you can find some common ground. Right. Um, Alon, you know, she's referring to, you know, the sort of the clashing of the different cultures and how those are brought together. And again, you and I know, you know, from from years of listening to you, um, you always insist that we don't use culture for bad behavior because culture, and I'm talking about corporate culture mainly, is the activator for innovation and for new things and, you know, for this, for this flourishing that we want in our industry if we're going to get to where we need to go. Is that about right? Well, that's exactly right. I mean, business besides um, creating jobs and helping people and individuals and families, it also um, um, should be the force of good. And it should be uh, the one of the ambassadors of how the world could be. And I always took that very seriously, for example, at GeoShare, the one of the uh, best aspects of the having a diverse work, workforce was that when we would travel throughout the world, it was an international business, people would see the diversity that we had and it would set an example and it would show people what, what a better world can be when uh, all types of humans work together and create and bring the creativity and the inclusion that one does with diversity. So, um, I think business should take it very seriously. Uh, I believe many do. And um, I think it's the way forward as we become, uh, as our society and as the world gets closer together. May I, may I have a go back on that to, to Lon? Because this is something sure. that, you know, when I, when I wrote this article, I really had to sit and think critically about what I wanted to communicate. Because one of the things that I was afraid people would take from this was this, well, you have to change yourself in order to be accepted. And what I started to realize is we've created these organizations that are very large, but they have culture that is deeply embedded into mm -hmm. how they do business and is very difficult to change unless you have a large influx of individuals who are from another culture and placed in positions of power and in some ways can influence that culture from the inside. And so I often wonder about how organizations are looking at making these large scale culture changes so that we can get towards a level of parity in gender and minority representation, because really that's the answer. What I did was almost like a Band-Aid in order to build bridges and make advancements in my own personal career. I accepted that I would make changes to myself so that I could better fit into the culture. But really, it would have been great if the culture could have fit better for me. And, and so what, what is happening, although it's too slow for me, still it is happening is that the cultures, corporate cultures are recognizing that they have to have a more diverse group of people. The diversity and inclusion is fundamental to their success because if they believe in that, they're more likely to attract and retain and enable creative and effective people. So it is changing again, too slow for, for my taste, but still it's, it's happening. Now, you, you talk about culture. The culture 
has to buy into that diversity is a fundamental ingredient to their success of their business. If you see that, if you see that in a company, the odds are they're at least thinking about it, but then they have to train their leaders to be able to do that and not just passively say, this is a good idea, mm -hmm. but, to, but to actively try to change. And also at the end of the day, it's each individual it has to be the change that they want, the, that, that state that's saying, but it is true, particularly of leaders. They have to be aware of their power and aware that they can actually change the world, or at least their little part of it. And it, it has a multiplier effect because then we have people who want to come to the company, people who want to be part of that culture, and then things change. You know, oh, and that goes back to what Raina was saying about, you know, an active element here. This, this has to be persistent because what I would say to that, you know, my observation of it is, is the reason it's different, uh, difficult is because of the, <laughs> the second law of uh, the second noble truth of Buddhism. I mean, to, to use the only example I can think of at the moment, which is the reason we suffer, according to that teaching, is because we resist change. And the world changes every second. I mean, those of us in the space and satellite industry should know that better than anyone, right? And yet it is fundamental to human beings for whatever reason to grasp and, and never, never, never change. And, and so the, I think the, the question that begs itself is how do you facilitate change more quickly in an industry that almost demands it? Um, and, and I think mentorship is, is, is fundamental to that. Lon, you know, I think you've been very uh, articulate in terms of recognizing power, recognizing, you know, what you need to do to shift it. Um, but I wanna go back to mentorship, Raina, because as we talk about this, how, what, how would you define your most important mentorship experience? And did it accomplish some of the things that we're talking about? Um, within within the university or the organizations that you've been involved with? Yeah, for me, um, kind of thinking about maybe more in terms of my role as being an ally versus um, kind of being in the position where I needed an ally. For me, I re really loved getting to mentor the younger cohorts of the fellowship I was uh, in at the Science and Technology Policy Institute. At that point in your career, um, you know, the people I got to mentor were uh, fresh out of university. And uh, that's kind of sort of the point that you're really starting your first full-time job. Um, and so it's kind of cool to have that, that opportunity to get to mentor people on a new project, on new subject matter, or on how science policy in the government works. But it's also kind of a point where you get to sort of mentor the person as a brand new young professional mm. um, and someone who's trying to sort of navigate the world post-university. What's, what's the single most significant obstacle to, you know, getting someone over that, over that, uh, that hump where they're, they're afraid of the culture that they're in? Is there, is there some sort of mentoring, um, I would say device, but some sort of element in the mentoring relationship where you get someone so comfortable in the organization that, you know, again, to go back to what, what Lon was saying, uh, they, they perform fully without having to, you know, invent themselves for the purposes of the culture, as Aisha was saying. I know that's a yeah. long question. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, I think there, to me, there are a couple of things. So one, I'll loop back to to what I was hearing Aisha kind of try to emphasize, which is honesty. Um, and the second thing would be a willingness to go to bat for your team 100% of the time. So I think, you know, one thing with uh, the first thing, honesty, right, is kind of being honest with sort of uh, where your company or workplace culture is in that moment, mm -hmm. uh, being honest with where you would like it to be in the future, being honest with what you are doing to get it from that point A to point B. Um, and being kind of honest with expectations. I think in particular, the nature of the work that I was doing, it was quite um, interagency. And so it meant that we were navigating a lot of different cultures between various different offices um, and administrations and uh, departments. Um, the second thing I think is, you know, sort of a confidence in the person who's who's leading a project or who's leading the organization right mm. it's that you know that that person 
is going to have your back 100% of the time. Um, and I think both the honesty aspect and that element of kind of trust and confidence, um, again, going back to that original definition of allyship, those are kind of active things you take on every day. Uh, could I just, could yeah. just uh, go, talk, go, talk, talk to that one? Please, Juan. Yeah. <laughs> now this is this is where this is part of, the part of this conversation is really just about mentorship in in, in general, um, and um, what uh, Raina just said was so fundamental to being a good mentor. Um, it's not just empowering people. A lot of people say, you know, I delegate authority to you. I'm you're empowering you. You can go ahead and do this. Go run with it. Whatever. But what people don't say. And even more important, what the leaders don't do is take responsibility for that person's action. And instead, they, they, the other person, if they make a mistake, who's trying to learn, they feel alone. What I always try to tell people, and I, and I live this all the time, and people know it, is that if you, if, if I've given you authority, if you if it's your job and I say you are now empowered to get it done, you have to know that I am now fully responsible for your actions and whatever happens here is fine. If you make a mistake, I'll own it with you. If you have an accomplishment, well, for the most part, I'll give you the credit, so don't worry about that. But the point is, is that you are watching over them. You are taking full responsibility so that they feel free, that they can make mistakes, that they can stretch, that they can do whatever they need to do to accomplish the job. And if they stumble, you're right there, pick them up, and you take the full brunt of the force to make sure they can keep on going. And I think that's what's critical when you're trying to develop people and be a mentor. You're there for them, particularly in the bad times. And that's, you know, I would assume that's your definition of, of being an accomplice. And it, and it really revolves around trust, doesn't it? Because once, once that's established, all things are possible. Once that's vanquished, um, you have to either rebuild it or it's, it's something that gets lost. Um, speaking to that, Aisha, what did you finally do when someone, I, I say, what did you do when someone finally called you a bitch? <laughs> uh, I've been called a bitch more times than I can remember. I mean, it's one of those things where if I had a nickel for every time, right? <laughs> right. I think that if I were writing the op-ed five years ago, I don't think I would have openly admitted the fact. And when you're dealing with a publication like Aviation Week that's been around for more than 100 years, you take a moment and you pause and you say, am I really going to push this? Am I really going to ask that they use this yeah. five letter word? But in that moment, I realized that I was not doing the service to the reality of women in the workplace. These are the experiences that we have. We don't just face them. We have them. And yet in reflecting on this time and in what my sponsor was doing in order to prepare me for that moment, I still shied away from just being honest about the reality of being not only just a woman, but an African-American woman in aerospace. And I really wanted to say, look, this is what is happening. And this individual understood that and took the time, put in the energy and made sure that I wasn't going to hear that for the first time on his center without being prepared to respond in a way that would not potentially right. damage my career or my relationship mm. with that individual because the use of the word isn't necessarily something that I at the time want to address in a way that could have long-term implications on my career, right? Yeah, no, that's that's that, and that was brilliant on your mentor's part. It was was that a man or a woman your mentor? Did, did it was a man, and you know what I love about about this story, and really kind of pulling from the archive of my professional experiences, he is what someone would consider to be a very traditional male in aerospace. That is who he is, and he understood that diversity is more than just ethnicity and gender. It is the fact that we are an industry that is constantly solving hard 
problems. Mm -hmm. We need a wide variety of perspectives and thoughts to do that to the best ability that we can. And so we can't get hung up on, well, you're a woman and I'm a male and you're African-American and I came from Wisconsin or Missouri or wherever and I've never met someone that was like you. We need to move past that because we're trying to go to Mars. (laughs) we're we're trying to do really interesting things and so people talk to me about diversity yeah there there are those elements but I want to remind them that what we really are trying to do is find more doctors to combat pandemics like COVID we need more scientists to study things like global climate change and we need more engineers to look at infrastructure challenges that we have in the United States we could go to the existing individuals who are excited about the field and currently in it and entering it or we can increase the number of people in the field by going to those who are not entering it and guess what if you want some proof go to Harvard read their business cases the data is already there the data speaks that women and minorities lead to better workplaces from the perspective of greater market shares and value to new and existing client bases. So we've got that, we've studied that, we know that. The question is what are you and I and everybody gonna do about that so that our companies and our workplaces can be the beneficiaries? Exactly, and as I said, and and I I think that's very well said and the innovation comes from there too, the cultural and social innovation that we were talking about earlier. When, when you start bringing in those different voices, different cultures, you know, whether they're from uh, the Bahamas or whether they're from Mexico or whether they're from New York City, whatever, whatever, when you start mashing that up, that, I mean, that's the whole virtue of it, at least theoretically. Um, you know, Alana, as, as, as she was uh, describing that experience, her mentor did a heck of a job of coaching her, preparing her for what was to come without her, you know, even being aware of that. It seems to me that's the essence uh, and first, that he did that in the beginning was was terrific, and I'm assuming he was a good mentor um, throughout the whole process, um, not just not just that moment, but it it defined both his his awareness of of his awareness of each individual, including Aisha at the time, as well as preparing people for being able to work in the environment because he wanted a more diverse workplace. And he knew the way to get it was to deal with each person as an individual and tell them what they may face. I'm also assuming that you could keep on going, now, by the way, I'm assuming this Aisha, you'll, you'll tell me otherwise, but that you could keep on going back to him as you had your own challenges. Um, and, and that's what you want. That's what, what I strive for is not that one time welcome, which very is, by the way, is very important. And when I have people come in I'm very clear that diversity is key here and I need to um, understand uh, if you have any challenges uh, that you know there's, there's zero tolerance, but this is a funny thing you have to do. You have to be able to say, look, there's, there's zero tolerance for anything other than you know, full diversity and people have to feel comfortable here. But, on the, but you have to also say, but on the other hand, I want you to know that you can come to me and tell me I'm not going to give someone a death penalty unless, of course, it's such an egregious, you know, terrible thing that someone said or did. But um, otherwise, we'll work it through. And I have had many, I can give you many examples of working these issues through with the team. And you want everyone to feel comfortable to bring to you these kind of challenges that they face. And you got to keep on reinforcing that. And you got to keep on checking in with them and to make sure that, that they know that you're there for them, as well as that you can solve the challenges as well as as you're solving them you're not you know raining hell on people you're you're actually working through the issues so you create a better team and uh, even greater diversity yeah and it's not always a pretty thing uh, to work through it um reina we're, we're getting near the end i've got <clears throat> a couple of questions left though i i was um i was actually doing a a, a podcast or i'm sorry it was a a session, panel session with someone from the Kwantlen uh, First Nations tribe up in, in Western Canada. And they were talking about the reconciliation process. They've never actually never su- uh, signed a seated treaty um, with the with sort of the white Canadian government, but there's um, been a reconciliation, national reconciliation there. And we, we got into a discussion about forgiveness and what that looks like. Um, 
because forgiveness is a very powerful psychological and spiritual tool and one that I think most of us believe that if you can find a way to it, you can go forward. It does open up things. Uh, you had talked at the outset about resistance, um, continuing to push forward. Um, when you are in a situation where you have been offended, either by the culture or a colleague or whatever, whatever, whatever it happens to be, to what degree for you is forgiveness a tool to move forward or is it not? <laughs> yeah, um, I think, you know, when I think about being an ally, when I think about, um, you know, wanting to be anti-racist, anti-sexist, anti-homophobic, anti-fill-in-the-blank, right, I have to think of it as a never-ending learning process, mm -hmm. right, and that can seem a little daunting at the outset, but, you know, if you think about it, we as humans kind of go through these lifelong learning processes, right? Mm -hmm. We're kind of lifelong students. So th thinking about it kind of in that terms means, you know, I'm not always going to know the answer and other people aren't always going to know the answer, right? And so we're, along the way, we're going to make mistakes. And so I think, you know, in being a good ally, there has to be a sense of self-forgiveness, right? Uh, mm -hmm. when you make mistakes. And I think um, in terms of trying to create a workplace where there is um, that, that strong sense of trust, there also has to be a sense of, you know, if, if you make a mistake, um, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Um, we're gonna learn, you know, what the mistake was, uh, why it was a mistake and how we can move forward and reconcile that way. Aisha, uh, does that, resonate at all with you? Is that is that one way? Um, white men can help make aerospace more inclusive uh, by, by being more forgiving of themselves and saying, you know, we're in a different world now and let's move forward. And then you forgiving whatever uh, offenses you feel. You know, there's a, a quote that uh, I like to remind myself of when I'm in positions where I feel like I need to invoke a little forgiveness. And that's um, that holding on to anger is like drinking poison and expecting yes. the other person to die. I, I've had so many situations when I've been wronged by people who knew that they were wrong. And I think it's important to mention that, right? People who were deliberately doing things to spite or be hurtful. And in those situations, because I, I think there's a, an element here that is not often discussed, which is there are deliberate bad actors in these conversations. And that the forgiveness piece is often not for them, it's for you. But don't forget the experiences that I've had that have been the most formative for me have been the ones where I felt were deliberate and I use them as motivation and a source of personal power to change the world around me. That's why I'm a CEO of a company that I founded. That's why we have STEM outreach and engagement initiatives. That's why I created a coding kit to help students learn how to code at home in the pandemic, right? Because yes. I remember that we are not as far as society would like to think we are. I'm from a hundred year old aerospace program that has graduated less than 30 African-Americans since they founded the program. In 100 years, we have a long way to go and they are doing good compared to a lot of other universities and institutions. You can look to the tech numbers and diversity in Silicon Valley if you need any more data to show you that we got a long way to go. So my approach to this is forgive, but don't forget and use those experiences as a way to help motivate positive impact to shape a better future. Yeah. You know, you... Can I jump in really quickly just to, to loop Please. back on that? So when I talk kind of about um, forgiveness in the workplace, yeah, I, I completely agree with Aisha. It can't, when I say forgiveness, right, it's not um, kind of a, a schoolyard forgiveness where someone says, I'm sorry, and you say, okay, let's keep working, um, right? It, the act of forgiveness has to be a part of that greater reconciliation where there's an acknowledgement of what the harm was um, and and how 
how people will move forward, right? And so I think that's where kind of like, you know, if there are bad ac actors who aren't willing to acknowledge uh, that harm was done, um, then yeah, that's kind of when you have to um, forgive almost for your own sake, right? And I think yeah. that's uh, kind of what Aisha's point uh, was. It is, it's, it is a three-dimensional, it is a three-dimensional problem. It's, it's, You're absolutely it's, right. Can, can I just comment on two points? Go ahead, I'm, I'm well, another question well, for you. Okay, sure. I'll, I'll be really quick. Look, as far as the leaders go, in particular, um, there has to be the self awareness and the self improvement, and and um, uh, I am I personally, I'm always trying to improve. I, I I have no monopoly on on anything here. I I recognize that things have to change, and uh, personally, self improvement is fundamental here. With regard to forgiveness, um, as far as managing a group goes, it is important for the mentor, the ally, the leaders to make sure that um, they are actively adjusting things to make the world better. Yeah, you know, Lana, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, again, given your experience, um, I know it's your assumption that that people want to improve and be better and learn. You you sort of come from that place. And I think if I'm if I'm hearing our, our other colleagues here, they're they're thinking that as well. Um, what what do you do when you have someone in the organization who is performing, who really doesn't cross any lines, um, but you, you realize that he or she has reached the limit in terms of, of the development of some of the things that we're talking about. Um, what do you do at that point when, when someone you know has personally reached their limit? Um, you mean the limit in being able to change? Yeah, yeah, just to, yeah. the overall I, I, I well, because I mean, not, not everybody I, can go there. I, I, I understand the question intellectually, but I don't agree with the premise. And that okay. is that, and, and, the, and the, the premise is that people can't change if, if, if they are become aware. Now, yes, there are horrible people in this world and they don't want to change. And I, Maybe I can't even change them, but me being the ultimate optimist, I'll always think we can even change those people and see the benefit of, of what we're trying to achieve with diversity and inclusion. But putting those people aside, in an organization, I think, you know, um, I mean, Aisha was just giving you statistics and saying how much further we have to go. And you just, the statistics exist to show that diversity is is going to help any organization. It's going to improve any organization and it's going to allow humanity to achieve even more. Mm -hmm. So I would never give up on that thought and I would never give up on any individual who's working in the environment. Some people take time more than others. And also people you know, sometimes don't want to change. If they have plenty of other things to do, whatever it is. It's your job to keep on working on them, try to do it sometimes gently, sometimes not, but always caring that they change and that they see the value in what you're trying to achieve. If they see the value for the organization and for themselves, they will change. Yeah, at some point, um, you, you believe you can make that transition. I, I think the best advice I ever got you know, for, for managing people was, if it's not working, you're, you know, you're, stop zigging and zag. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, try something else. <laughs> Turn your head. Slow your speech. Yes, uh, but keep listen, on going in. More. But keep on going in the direction, regardless whether you're zigging or zagging. Yeah, yeah. Keep uh, keep on chasing what you what you're trying to achieve. Be an invisible is, guru. Yeah, that kind of thing. Um, okay. Uh, but wait, listen, we're coming up on the end of this. But I wanted to ask each of you, um, Aisha. I'm going to start with you. Uh, social media um, is it a useful platform for mentorship or in any of the other types of boundary crossings that we're looking at today? Absolutely. One of the things I've loved about the rise of social media is the ability to represent careers more completely. And so someone can say, hey, I'm, I'm listening to Aisha and I'm listening to this podcast. I can go online and I can see her career. I can get a better understanding of what it takes to not only be in the aerospace engineering field, but also to be a CEO or to be an entrepreneur. And so I, I love that. I feel like, you know, speaking with and following mentors where safe, 
on social media can not only help individuals clarify exactly what they want to accomplish or pursue, but it also can point them in the right direction to help them formulate a plan because many of us are in positions that we never would have imagined that we would be in, right? I thought mm -hmm. I was gonna be in aerospace forever. People might be surprised to find out that as a, you know, a CEO of a product company that I did certain things to, to get here, right? And, and so I think being able to share the story and have people see visual representations of careers is very important. Rain, I'm gonna to jump to you on that question and then we'll end with Lon's answer. Yeah, um, you know, before social media, I think I had colleagues who I would only see, you know, maybe once a year at a conference or, or once a year at a meeting, right? And so for me, social media, and in particular, you know, I think I use Twitter the most, um, it's such an awesome platform to get to know folks who I already knew better and to get to know folks who weren't on my radar at all. And I think for me, what I particularly like on Twitter is that, you know, we get to interact so much more frequently and have kind of a free exchange of thoughts and ideas. But, you know, sometimes we also get to kind of share personal vignettes. Um, we share yeah. a lot of our work on Twitter, but mm -hmm. we also kind of share personal accomplishments as well. And so you get to know these multifaceted people who are your colleagues. Um, and, you know, as much as we love our work, it's, it's not the only part of our lives. And so, you know, I think um, I've really gotten to enjoy getting to know um, people as who they are. Um, right, as the person and not just um, as the work they do. Right. Lon, XM Radio, of course, you know, just sort of filled society with, with different narratives, different types of dialogues, you know, allowed a lot of different people to share a lot of different stories. But but social media today, um, how, how is it looking to you? Do you agree with um, Aisha well, and Reina? Well, um, I mean, social media is having a reckoning in uh, on, on the bad side of it, particularly politically. And I think that's good. So we can reflect more on its use, both for positive as well as for negative. I mean, we have to, you know, as, as humans, what we keep on doing is we keep on inventing technologies and then we figure out what to do with them. And sometimes they're, they're used for, for um, bad things versus good things. But on the good side of social media, and this is um, what I think uh, uh, my colleagues here are referring to, is that it allows you to find others who are fi having the same challenges as well as the same thrills, as well as the same interests, as well as others with different interests, you can find them more readily and more easily. And it reinforces your own um, uh, existence. It keeps pushing you forward because you know there are others out there who um, are experiencing similar things. And I think that's been the reason why we have we have advanced so much in our society, even though there have been some challenges. We also keep on advancing because we see other like-minded people who are, going back to the words we're using, allies and accomplices and others who share your values and your interests. And, and you're not alone. There are others here who, who, um, who support you in their own environments. I think that is one of the great benefits of social media, that um, it reinforces yourself as an individual um, and as part of a group. Yeah, and as you say, the technology is neutral. It's, it's, it's how we use it, how we choose to experience it um, in some of the areas that we've been talking about. Um, we're out of time. I'm gonna, I'm gonna close with a sentence from um, Aisha's article, uh, which everybody should read in Aviation Week, January 6th. If you can't get it, come to SSPI. We'll give it to, we'll send it out to you. Um, Aisha, you say near the end, until we get to where we need to go, we will need people in power to take us under their wings and make sure we have the tools we need to thrive. Um, as an old advertising copywriter, I couldn't have said it any better myself. So thank you for that. And that concludes my conversation with Aisha Bo, Lon Levin, and Raina Buonconsale. Thank you so much, you three, for, for coming on here and, and going over time with us here. Um, Anna let us have another 15 minutes. So I appreciate you sticking around. Thanks so much, Lou. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. Thank you, Aisha and Reina. And thanks once again to Hughes Network Systems for their support for this series. Stay tuned next Monday for another episode. 
SSPI is the voice of the space and satellite professional. It connects the people of the invisible, indispensable industry that makes the world better every single minute of the day. To see more of our Better Satellite World campaign, go to bettersatelliteworld.com. If you're not a member of SSPI and would like to know more, go to sspi.org. And if you're a student, your membership is free. And follow us on Twitter at SSPI and check us out on LinkedIn and Facebook. For Space and Satellite Professionals International and our producer, Ana Gomez, I'm Lou Zaccarella. Let's make it a better satellite world. Take care, everybody.